Okay, let's start. Uh, hello all, welcome to the first uh, people of Bernardo Veredo Symposium for uh, 2023. I have to say I'm particularly proud of this meeting because uh, we have been working on the Think Open initiative since 2008, about 2008. And so far we were not able to organize something related to animal research, which represents a relevant part of uh, CIMEC research efforts and experiences. Uh, this was possible uh, because uh, I found uh, uh, two people who worked together with me in setting this meeting up, Mirko Zanon and Matilde Berrino. Uh, thanks again. If we were in an online, in an in-person meeting, I would ask you for an applause for uh, these two people. But as far as we are in a virtual room, I leave the floor to Matilde, who will be the chairperson for today. Matilde, please. Thank you. Um, hello, all. Thank you, Victorio. Um, thanks for being here today. So just a few um, housekeeping communication. Uh, first of all, this meeting is uh, recorded, so and we will publish it on CIMEC YouTube channel as it was um, noticed in the meeting registration page. Um, then regarding the certificates of attendance, uh, they will be sent within one week. Um, also, we will try to have some short break uh, of two, three minutes if we, we will be on time, let's hope. And uh, also, there are a few ways to interact with the speakers, as you can see here in the slide. So you can either raise the hand, uh, use the raise and uh, zoom button or type question in the chat. And once we will notice your request, we will ask you to unmute and you will have the chance to uh, ask your question. Or you can type on the, the question in the chat and we will read it and ask uh, the speaker for the answer. Um, so having said that, we, today we will try to discuss how the adoption of open science approaches may improve multidisciplinary cross-model and cross-species uh, research. This requires the integration of both specific domain tools and wide range standardized ways of extracting and reporting results. And we will start with a contribution by Luigi Petrucco. Luigi is a postdoc at the Italian Institute of Technology, working uh, with uh, Giuliano Urilli on the physiology of subcortical uh, circuits for innate behavior. And during his PhD, he developed uh, Bearing Globe which is a Python ecosystem for com of computational neuroanatomy across um, phylogenetic tree. So today we'll introduce us to this tool and uh, please Luigi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matilda. So uh, let me share my screen. I hope you can see my slides. Um, yes, we can. So yeah. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity um, of presenting this this project. I'm very I'm very fond of it. Is uh, it was a side project for for during my PhD, but I grow very fond of it, and I hope uh, some of you at least might find it useful and interesting. So um, the project started from the observation that, uh, like um, in general, neuroscience is going toward uh, more and more toward approaches that are tackling many different questions uh, at the molecular level, like transcriptomics, electrophysiology, imaging, connectomics. Um, they are tackling those problems uh, more and more at the level of the, uh, of the whole brain. So we have seen um, uh, a very large increase in the number of data sets that are being released, uh, where um, data from many different modalities are really collected uh, thoroughly Throughout the throughout the brain, uh, not only on uh, the brain of uh, the the structure of region, uh, the region of interest of what, one investigator, and um, and shared with other researchers who might find some value in them. And um, people uh, who work with those uh, with those kind of data have been develop are, are have been developing many many different tools uh, to to work with them, like uh, software tools that are required to handling such large scale um, data sets to register them, annotate them, extract uh, information, segment them in, in many ways. But uh, many of those approaches are uh, often like develop, development efforts that, are, uh, that happen within a specific community and so are uh, often targeted to uh, a very specific uh, atlas, for example, uh, or the um, 
um, the software that has been developed by the Allen Brain that uh, is uh, lamp is always made uh, available across their uh, their own um, their own software on one specific atlas. And um, a particular case in point, which is actually how all of this uh, started, uh, like all of this brain globe started. Uh, there, uh, there was this uh, brain render software that uh, was developed by Federico Claudi SSWC. Um, and it is a super nice software that is uh, using a beautiful visualization li library to create 3D uh, representations of uh, neuroscientific data. So uh, for example, data on gene expression, uh, reconstructed penetration path from electrophysiological probes, uh, connectivity information, single cell morphology extracted by uh, from whole brain data sets. Um, it is a, a Python interface to create visualizations on uh, on all those kinds of data. And back then I was working with Zebrafish. I was also performing like whole brain imaging. So I, I had to make a, a lot of whole brain visualizations. And I saw this tool and they were like, oh, wow, like this is uh, super interesting. I, I would really like to, to use this, like to make those visualizations for my Atlas as well. And uh, coincidentally, like exactly when I was thinking this, uh, Federico Claudi at some point, I was following him to, uh, on Twitter and he, he tweeted that like he was uh, interested in expanding uh, the scope of his project and try to reach different communities, not only uh, the mouse community, but also uh, neuroscience people uh, outside of it. So I read the tweet and I was like, yeah, uh, wow, let's, let's, let's try to push this forward and let's try to, uh, to make this tool uh, work on, on Zebrafish as well. It was also during the pandemic, so I was at home with a lot of time to code uh, at, at hand. And so uh, I team up with uh, Federico Claudi and another collaborator that I, um, whose project I will mention later. And we started investigating uh, what what is out there, uh, how how was happening, like how, how were uh, different atlases for different species distributed, and we made some uh, background research. And of course, we we found that probably several of you are already aware that uh, there are many different communities that by now have uh, published atlases that are available for uh, many different species: mouse, zebrafish, Drosophila, rats, but also like more uh, less. Uh, less mainstream um, neuroscience model, uh, not only marmos, but also birds and uh, insects that are not Drosophila. And there's a growing tendency of uh, publishing those, those kind of atlases that are very useful resources. Uh, but the problem uh, with those atlases is that often they don't really come with uh, integration in mind, like um, for example, for the zebrafish, there was an atlas that I used to uh, to browse, but it was uh, an atlas that was just served through a, an online uh, interface, like a web application. So one would have to go to that specific website and browse through their data. And, um, and overall, it was uh, a bit clunky because then if you want to, uh, for example, uh, use those data in your software, you have to download it and every atlas would have a different web API and it would be uh, very convoluted. Um, some projects, for example, the Allen Brain um, project was also serving uh, a Python library to interact with their atlas, but it, uh, this Allen SDK, but it was a very, it, it is a very um, large and heavy um, library that serves not only uh, the fruition of the atlas, but also many other data that are um, available through the, through the Allen interface. So we were wondering whether uh, we could uh, have a tool that was solving those kind of problems. And uh, so to have uh, something that allows analysis pipeline not to have this remote data fetching um, and in general being uh, uh, give to uh, developers the possibility of creating Atlas agnostic piece of so software for their work. Um, and in our actually a very similar problem was already tackled and there is a library called NatVerse, like an ecosystem called NatVerse were exactly a uh, similar concepts that being applied. But in Python, uh, there was no, um, no example available, like no, no existing tool available. So um, we decided to coin this, uh, this term, like this um, name, this project BrainGlobe. And uh, we started this effort of creating a Python-based uh, ecosystem of interoperable tools 
uh, with the idea of making them atlas atlas agnostic, and um, also uh, um, together with this to um, to design a, a very uh, lightweight super minimal library that we call uh, BZ, BG for Brain Globe Atlas API. Um, which is a, a very uh, small um, module that one can use in Python to access through um, through many different uh, through uh, to the data of all the different atlases that we serve um, under this ecosystem. And so uh, the overall uh, idea of this organization, and we can we can discuss it later, is like there are uh, there has been several people developing um, atlases out there, and many of like of course all of them are super interested in making their atlas as uh, wide uh, widely known and used as possible. So we would cooperate with them, and we offer them a, a suite of tools to easily convert. Um, their data, put their data in the format that is um, um, that is served by BrainGlobe, so that then users of those atlases, as well as developers of uh, neuro computational, uh, like neuro anatomical computational tools, uh, can just uh, write their software referring to the BrainGlobe Atlas class that is always uh, the same, uh, the same structure, the same API, the same interface through uh, data that can come from uh, different atlas atlases. Um, yeah, so after a super easy and straightforward installation, the idea is that there are uh, very simple functions that are implemented uh, in this library. Uh, for example, we can uh, download uh, different atlases of like very different kind of atlases at different resolutions. Uh, we can download them, we can keep them outdate, uh, updated on our machine if there are new releases of the same, of the same atlases. Um, and then with very, very minimal code, we can create uh, uh, objects that are like atlases objects that are instantiated just um, with the uh, starting from the name of the atlas. And once we have this, uh, this, uh, this atlas object, we can uh, very easily start uh, like um, accessing within Python all the information about the atlas. So uh, each one of those of those atlases objects have um, mainly three uh, core data associated with them. So there's of course a description of the atlas. So there is metadata, um, and there is a full description of the hierarchy of brain structures that have been parcelated in that um, in that atlas. And then there are stacks that describe. Well, there is. Um, reference anatomical um, stack that is uh, the template that show the image of the brains. It can be like a CT scan or like a um, epifluorescence kind of image that just show the outline of the, um, of the whole brain. And then there is a stack that is uh, an annotation, uh, like a region annotation stack, where each voxel is associated uh, a number that um, each is each uh, brain region that has been parcelated. And then a mask for hemispheres in the case of uh, slightly asymmetric atlases, and then each each the, of the regions that are each, each of the brain structures also have uh, can have associated meshes. And for example, yeah, we can just uh, print the atlas to have a look at the metadata, and um, we can have a look at the, um, for example, just printing the structures attribute will show us the the whole hierarchy of the um, of the brain. Uh, segmentation, and we can, for example, uh, go deeper and look into the details of a specific region where we find the full name, the path of that region in the hierarchy, and um, a number of other attributes to describe it. Um, and we can very easily get the reference stack and the annotation stack. And for example, if we go and um, and um, plot those, we can see that the reference stack is actually the grayscale um, image. Uh, that describe the uh, the full stack that yeah we can print at different points, and the annotation stack is the corresponding stack uh, with each um, voxel associated with um, the ID of the region that uh, correspond to that position in the brain. Um, and there's also like tools for uh, getting which brain region a specific coordinate is, or to easily create masks. Uh, for different brain regions, for example, isocortex in this case, that if we plot, we then just see um, have, uh, just Boolean masks that parse the, um, the outline of a specific brain region. 
And yeah, so this is the, the gist of it. There's a bunch of other utilities. And yeah, we have, we have been uh, developing, uh, actively expanding the number of available atlases. You can have a look on the website for, for a full list of, list of those. Um, and yeah, for example, to just um, show an example of what you can now do, and I was uh, able to do finally after implementing this kind of um, this kind of um, interoperable library, uh, I can now go back to Brain Render, which is now uh, supported by by Atl uh, by um, BG Atlas API in the background, and I can take the code that Federico was using to uh, to generate a visualization, and I can literally take the same code. And just changing the the atlas name and the name of the region to obtain very similar visualizations um, of um, mice and and um, and zebrafish brains. And of course, this means that the same tool uh, can be much easily accessed throughout different communities on one side, and on the other, the same atlas can benefit from uh, um, tools that are uh, developed by uh, by people that are not the people who developed that atlas in the first place. And yeah, another example is um, uh, BrainRag, which is a tool for registration of brain volumes developed by Adam Tyson, who was the, the third collaborator on uh, the kickoff of uh, BrainGlobe, um, as well as CellFinder, which is another tool that he developed for uh, detecting like a neural network based tool to detect um, single cells in whole brain data sets, um, disentangling them from many other artifacts that can be parsed as cells in such data. Um, and yeah, using using this atlas, people can also very easily using the same tool. You can very easily move from one kind of reference to the other and just show it your data, for example, uh, with dif with different parcellations. Um, yeah, so we have now this e ecosystem of interoperable tools, um, and there is um, an expanding um, open source community that is growing around it. Uh, the project is actively maintained as SWC uh, in particular. There's several repositories, uh, different projects going on. There's many code contributors, um, many downloads of, uh, of this package. And yeah, the outlook is, uh, I'd say, positive because it has been funded for maintenance and development by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So we have now a stable version 1.0, uh, but we are now thinking um, there are mainly, uh, I am now a bit uh, behind the scenes, um, thinking of releasing a new version of the Atlas with some uh, improvements. They are working to develop, the to integrate it more and more closely with Napari, which is a very nice tool, Python tool for like the Python equivalent to uh, ImageA for visualizing and analyzing images. Um, and of course, we are constantly in the need for user feedbacks uh, and new atlases to support or distribute and new software that want to integrate with our uh, ecosystem. Um, yeah, many different places where you can find information if you just Google um, Breakflow. And yeah, with this, I would just like to thank all the new collaboration uh, to this project, uh, especially Federico and Adam, who with whom this, this project was uh, kicked off. And um, yeah, of course, um, all the founders that have been supporting um, these projects and you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luigi. <clears throat> very nice talk. Um, I don't know if there are quick questions because otherwise we could maybe go next move to Jean-Charles talk and then have a final moment of discussion but if there is anyone who wants to uh, ask something now uh, he or she can do it mm. I don't know okay so maybe we can move to to the next speaker uh, with Jean-Charles uh, Mariani. Jean-Charles is a postdoc at the Italian Institute of Technology working with Alessandro Gozzi on the development of functional ultrasound imaging. And during his PhD, he has worked on this technique and today he will speak about challenges standardizing this novel uh, imaging modality. So please, uh, uh, Jean-Charles, the floor is yours. All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, wait. And here we are. 
OK. Uh, so what I'm going to discuss about indeed is about uh, mostly what I did on my PhD. So like Wiji, it was uh, initially a, a side project. Uh, and so I, I will start with a disclaimer. So I am in no way uh, an expert in, uh, in bids, which is this like uh, uh, data structure uh, uh, tool that I will, uh, I will show you. Uh, so I'm more like uh, amateur, uh, who's enthusiastic about the thing. Uh, and I had a bit of experience. So the idea is that uh, doing motion ultrasound is a new technique. So we started from scratch. And there was this idea at some point to try to standardize things. So with, uh, uh, with the community, we discussed uh, how to do it and we turned to bids. Uh, so I dig into it and I, I, I am quite comfortable with the ecosystem, but what I'm going to present you is really not about uh, the technical aspect and, and uh, how to use it or, or whatever, because we are still in the process of validating our own uh, first bit. Uh, it's more like the arguments that are behind it and this idea of uh, sharing data. So when you, you start to want to share data, actually there are uh, things that you have to think about it and, uh, and during this like uh, uh, long time I spent on this project, uh, I actually realized that um, there are many of them. Uh, so, to do that, I will start with um, um, more like a philosophical uh, point of view, let's say, uh, to show you what are the motivations behind data sharing. Uh, so again, the idea is that it's, it's really like personal feedback about what I, uh, what I did and, uh, and where I stand now, where I understand uh, we can formalize the notion of data sharing. Uh, then I'm sorry, I will have to be a bit more technical and I will present quickly the, the, the bit standard and more precisely the fuse bits. Uh, so yeah, I will be like uh, your, your boring parents trying to tell you like, oh, you, uh, oh, this tool can be used to clean your data sets basically. Uh, but if it goes too technical, don't, don't, don't be afraid. So the idea is that this is not the point. The point is really about this example I will show. Uh, that are like, I think, generalizable and then bring like interesting uh, concepts to, to potentially discuss. And then I will quickly go beyond the notion of standard, which is the notion of uh, convention, which is ill-defined. Uh, and here really the idea is to, 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 to see this notion of like community. Uh, and when you share, actually you share with other people and, and it goes further than, that, than the standard. So I will try to illustrate this uh, with one example. So let's start with the motivation behind data sharing. And like all standardization process, it starts with the terminology. So the idea is that we have to speak the same language uh, and this is quite crucial. So we come back a bit later uh, on the details of it, but uh, basically our general question is like, oh, do we organize the data? And the first thing we have to do is actually what are the data? And uh, it's not that trivial actually, and, and we can define like multiple of them. Uh, so in our case, we are looking at images. So this is like a typical first imaging. So it's like a 2D image uh, in time uh, that we have to store, right? Uh, so, so basically we have these images, but during the experiment, actually we have got also like other type of data, which are like peri-experimental data, which would be in our case, so video of the, of the mouse, tracking of the animal during the experiment. Uh, and this will also be part of the data set. But the, the fundamentals that we want are the images, actually, and this goes around it. So these are the exp uh, very experimental data. And finally, we have the metadata, uh, which are like descriptive data for your data. So you have information that helps you make sense of the data. So for example, uh, you, 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 you might want to get like uh, technical information of your system, so the sampling rate, etc. So these are like uh, uh, descriptive, and uh, it helps make sense uh, of the actual data that you have. So, for example, time of the day can be interesting. Uh, you image a, a mouse in the morning or in the afternoon, it's not the same. So you might want to keep this uh, so, so that in your analysis, you can, you, you can use this, uh, this parameter. Finally, there are like some stuff. So, for example, now we know that the sex of the experimenter might have an influence for, uh, for the behavior of the mouse, for example. So this is also something that you might want to keep in your data set. And the question is like, oh, 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 do you? And so you have to keep in mind that it's a different type of data than your actual image. Uh, and there are ways to, to define it. So these are the main uh, uh, data that we are dealing with. And when that you have your, your data question, like how do you store them? And so this is more like a format question. Uh, so if we, we take the example of a 2D image, uh, well, what it will be actually is a bunch of coordinates and an intensity which is associated to this, uh, to this coordinate. Uh, so the, the, the question of, uh, of the format is really how do we encapsulate this information? So this is information, how do we make it available using your uh, uh, your disk, basically. 
so there is a much easier way than having a bunch of coordinates, which is storing the stuff in the matrix and uh, and keep on the side uh, the steps. So for example, we use the, the idea that the image is periodic in space uh, and we can store less information. And this is the format that tells you all oh, this information is encoded basically. Uh, and finally, the last uh, key component of the data structure is the structure itself. So uh, we have to find a structure for the data set. Uh, so how do we define a, a structure? It's like a hierarchical organization of your files. So basically, you're going to have folder, and within the folder, potentially other folder, and within these ones, the files that you're interested in. Questions like, how do we define this structure? So it is standardized, and people can make sense of it. Uh, then what we, we can see is that actually the filters that you create uh, are semantic twins. So let me give an example for this. So you have a collection of images. So that is a data set. Uh, and usually what people do is that they will make sense of the data. So for example, the first one uh, was acquisition with a specific treatment. And then we had like another treatment. And you might want to encapsulate your data in folders that are related on the treatment if this is the analysis you are interested in. But then potentially you have other variables that describe your data. So it's another partition of your data set. Uh, in this case, so female and male. And this is another way to structure the data. So the idea is that we just have to be to, to agree on the way that we do. And uh, and the notion of data structure uh, results in this kind of problem. So which one is the best? Is there one? So this is really like uh, uh, up to people. But you have like two different uh, choices in that I prefer treatment over sex. And I will first uh, separate my images in terms of treatment and then in terms of sex. Or I do the opposite. And I consider that the, the sex of male animal is very important to, for my analysis. Uh, and we do the other uh, well. So the idea of standardization is try to like find a common uh, uh, set of rules uh, to do that. So to, to, to conclude this terminology, these are kind of the important terms uh, that we have. So we have the data, the very important data, and the metadata. Then format is an important uh, uh, thing because it's the calculation of the information. Uh, and finally, the data structure can be defined in terms of semantic links between the image that you are uh, uh, you are storing, and finally, we need the hierarchy to uh, to make sense of it. So now let's go back to the motivations. And uh, what I will do is I will start with a little like philosophical uh, uh, explanation uh, of the problem. Uh, so the idea is, uh, is to introduce some concepts, so it's more like a framework, and then I will show like how this framework can be uh, uh, seen in practice. Uh, and finally, I will add just uh, two, two little arguments in terms of, uh, of ethics, because data sharing is also about like uh, living in a society and everything. So there are like some constraints on this. Uh, and what I will try to show you is that actually all of this relate to good scientific practice. So basically, each of the arguments results in like a better science of good. So that's why I think it, it can be interesting to start about structuring. So the philosophical point of view, uh, there are a bit like uh, two type of scientific reasoning that. Uh, uh, that can be defined. So there is the inductive reasoning, uh, which is the naturalistic point of view. And the canonical example is like Charles Darwin theory. So the idea is that uh, all along his life, he gathered information, he was observing things and, uh, and everything. And by getting all this information together, all these observations, he can reach conclusion, which becomes a theory. And so this is uh, uh, the, the way inductive reasoning is done. So you, you, you get some. Uh, information and you try to, to reach to a more general uh, law. On the other side of the spectrum, there is the deductive reasoning. Uh, in this case, so Albert Einstein's theory is, the, uh, is a good example. So the idea is more related to the, the, the mathematics and the logic. You will come from like hypotheses, from premise information. Uh, you will mix them together in a logical manner. Uh, and you can predict results. And, uh, and so sometimes you can predict results that are verified in like 100 years uh, after, which means that your deduction was like quite good actually. Uh, but the idea is that uh, we see that the data doesn't uh, happen at the, uh, at the same time. So you, uh, for the indu induction, you start with observation and for the deduction, you generate the information that you need uh, based on your, on your given. Uh, of course, two people uh, came around to say, okay, well, actually, each of the reasoning is not uh, so great. Uh, so there is the classical example of uh, Jung uh, with the, the black swan. So if you only see black swan in your life, you can generalize and say that all the swans are black, uh, which would be fallacious. So basically, the inductive reasoning has uh, a risk of tautology in the end. Uh, and the other side of the spectrum, which is uh, really the, the far one, so there is Kurt Gutel. 
we demonstrate that uh, actually the reasoning itself, the logic uh, is incomplete. So for us, basically, we can just uh, look at the notion of premise and the idea is that at some point you have to assume that something is true in order to be able to do the, the reason. So we see that there are like a uh, little uh, uh, risk in both of the, the types, so they are not complete, uh, both of them, which is that actually there is a, a cross uh, talk between the type of reason uh, because of the risk of tautology. So basically, what you would do is uh, you need, you, you create information, for example, for your deductive, uh, deductive reasoning, uh, which will help you, uh, so, so you will get new observations that might create the next uh, hypothesis. So there is this kind of, of circle uh, where you will alternate between the different type of, uh, of reasoning. And so we can see this like uh, cycle uh, of reasoning when you start with the observation. Uh, from this observation, you can like uh, generalize and make some hypotheses. Uh, and then you might want to test a specific uh, hypothesis or, and use uh, known theory to, uh, to, to make sense, uh, uh, to try to design an experiment that will generate new observations. And so we see that there is this cycle uh, where induction will be more between the observation and the hypothesis, and deduction will be between the, uh, the way to select one and design an experiment for it. And we see that data are actually at the transition between both. So based on this, there is this like classical scientific process, which is uh, usually defined as an inductive process. Uh, so there is an history behind it. Uh, and, and the usual way we do science is to like make this hypothesis, define uh, an experimental plan that will be allow, I mean, that will allow us to verify this hypothesis, generate a data set that follows this experimental plan, and then we can run the analysis and get the result. Which is that usually what happens, that you count your results, you have your significance, you publish, you're happy, and then you trust your data set because there is this data set was tuned to the question that you were asking. So that's a bit what was done um, with the whole world, let's say. Uh, more recently, there has been like a, a kind of a, a change in, in mindset with the apparition of like machine and, and deep learning. And using this like statistical uh, uh, tools has brought back like induction to the, the, uh, the front. Uh, and here the idea is that we start with the data, so we, we gather a lot of data, and then you can like mine features. And then you can use again like statistical theory to validate the features that you discover as something which is meaningful for, for the question that you, you might be interested in. Uh, so this new way has like uh, made some person worry and say, okay, actually the old way is, uh, is finished. There is no, no need for theory anymore because well, this can, so it is, it is quite important actually. Uh, and this is kind of like the, um, everybody knows data scientists and everything, the big data. Uh, so this is kind of a new way to, to approach science. So to, to conclude uh, on this like uh, internal introduction, so the idea is that we have a canonical scientific reasoning, uh, which is quite uh, accepted and which is deductive. Uh, and the idea is that you generate data tuned to your question. The issue is that then data becomes like a byproduct. Then we have like new methods. Uh, we try to leverage uh, in the induction reasoning. Uh, the problem with this method is that there are usually data consuming, they need a lot to, uh, to, to convert. Uh, but the advantage is that usually there are also like data agnostic. It doesn't really matter the context of your data, it depends on your question. Uh, but you can adapt uh, as long as you have like enough. Uh, and then we can define a, cy uh, a cycle in this case, uh, which is that actually we could use the byproduct of the first one uh, to leverage uh, the second one and make the, the new hypothesis uh, of the future. So data in this case are, are kind of the transition between them. Both. So in practice, what does it mean? Uh, it means that if you are like uh, doing this like new type of research, uh, what you need is uh, is an input. So you need a data. So you can use actually uh, the outputs of uh, other type of classical studies, but this requires data sharing, and that's that's where I, I wanted to go. Uh, so for that, you need people to uh, give access to this data, and you will be able to reuse it. It gives like a strong life to the data, uh, and this case, data uh, can be reused as input for induction. Alternatively, even if you are like uh, adept of the first type of science, uh, it is still interesting to share your data. Uh, so the idea is that in your hypothesis, there is a mathematical form formulation uh, uh, of your, uh, your question, uh, which usually is like classical test. Let's, uh, let's face it. Uh, so the idea is that you are measuring and you are based on a null hypothesis and you will try to uh, 
uh, to reject it, uh, to, to show that. Uh, and this is just like defining a distribution. And so once again, uh, the more information you have of, uh, on the, the, the uh, object that you are, you, are, you are looking at, better is going to be your inference. And so the idea is that you can leverage data set from uh, outside to optimize the tools that you use for your own analysis, as long as the data set is close enough to what you are looking at. So the idea is that now you can use data also to define and refine deduction hypothesis. Uh, so by sharing data, you maximize the chance that someone else finds something, for example. Uh, and this is, this is quite interesting. Uh, so I finished this introduction with like two uh, additional ethical concerns, uh, which is first the, the, the known like replication uh, crisis. Uh, so the idea is that there are like more and more questioning about like the way we do, we do science. And this paper, transparency is one of the, uh, uh, the way to, to try to, to reduce this replication. So if you give access to your data, uh, you are more transparent and people are going to be able to replicate your result with your data first before trying it in the experiment. Uh, and, and this is something which, uh, which is uh, important to keep in mind. Uh, and finally, we are also part of the society and we have like some responsibility because of that. Uh, most importantly, we do research, which usually are public funds. Uh, so the idea is that repeating over and over and over again the same experiment, generating the same data, is not necessarily uh, a good way to spend uh, public money. Uh, and it is also important in terms of environment because we, we, we have an impact, uh, which is quite important actually for research. Uh, and fi finally, we have to keep in mind that, uh, and some of us at least, uh, repeating this experiment where the data set uh, are aligned also is done at the expense of animal lives. So this is uh an ethical, an ethical question and, and sharing data can also participate in the triage uh, uh, for the reduction so these are a bit like all the arguments i, I gather to, uh, to to try to, to say okay so let's share our data uh, and uh, so what we, we saw is that data are crucial for the scientific reasoning whatever we, uh, we are doing uh, they are a byproduct of the canonical one uh, but there has been a methodological shift uh, which motivates to reuse this data uh, at least in one, uh, one sense, and then there are other ones. Uh, ultimately, so sharing your data uh, can make your science better because you will increase your statistical power if you have access to other data set to tune uh, uh, your tools. And finally, I hope that uh, actually sharing your data makes you a better person. But this is more subjective. Uh, so let's go back to the, 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 the title of this presentation, which is uh, first bit, so uh, a standard. Uh, I will try to be quick, and again, uh, if I'm not te too technical, it's, uh, it's not just try to keep the, uh, the, the main arguments here. Uh, so the brain imaging data structure uh, is quite recent. Uh, you can find all the information on this website, uh, and the idea is that uh, people doing MRI initially uh, uh try to find a way uh, to standardize the way they were structuring their data and so the idea is to uh, uh, to get like common rules to follow uh to facilitate this section so it's it's nice to want to, to share the data but if we don't speak the same language uh, it, it is just like super painful to to to, uh, to use and actually it worked like pretty well and now it's well expect, uh, accepted and a lot of repositories are using uh, are asking people uh, to be like bits compliant uh, to share their data so I will show you a bit more like uh, what it means. So it started with this paper, which comes from a, a, a conference, which itself is the conclusion of like 20 years of research, uh, actually 30 years of research in the MRFA. Uh, so just to summarize this paper, the idea is that uh, by using the BITS uh, uh, tool, uh, you, you, you have a minimized curation. So it facilitates the curation within the lab. And most importantly, because the, the, the roles are fixed also across lab and, and for public uh, sharing. It reduces also the, the risk of error because you have a systematic way to, uh, to naming your file and to structuring them. Uh, and this is like super uh, practical for the experimenters. And finally, it facilitates the automation of your analysis. And this is more like a super uh, uh, practical for the, uh, for the analysts. Uh, then BIT is uh, an ecosystem, so it started with MRI, and now you have access I mean, a lot of, uh, of different modalities have been added. So you have stuff for like EEG, PET, uh, uh, and spectroscopy, for example. And so it's building. Uh, and the idea is that so it shows that it is quite modular. Uh, and again, so what I'm going to present you is just an example. Uh, what you have to keep in mind is that uh, uh, it can be generalized to whatever you're doing. 
So the one image infra structure is mainly like five concepts. And this, this build uh, the directive. So there is a terminology again. I'll show you also what are the top structures, so the global features of your uh, structure. Then we we'll go back to the notion of uh, file format quickly. And I think the crucial uh, thing here are the file names. Uh, so we show you all your, uh, your should name your file if you follow the build uh, directives, uh, which brings us to, uh, to then the final hierarchy. So let's start with the terminology. So just quickly, so the idea is just to show you those. I started with the terminology. It is like global thing. We really have to speak the same language. And so the bits directive start with like certain uh, definitions of the terms uh, that, that allow to, to, to be sure that we are talking about the same thing. So you can find it like a bit uh, trivial, uh, but this is not necessarily the case. So this is an example for the first community. Uh, when we started to look at uh, actually what was happening in the ephemeral uh, community, and we realized that actually we are not necessarily speaking the same, the same language. Uh, so this is not necessarily uh, so pixel voxel uh, because we are doing 2D. A lot of people were, uh, were talking pixel. That's not too bad. Uh, but then we have like more confusing things. So for example, what we were calling a, a frame was actually called a scan in ephemeral, and when we were calling a scan was actually an image. Uh, and here we can see that it starts to be confusing and, uh, and quite dangerous, actually. So when you publish, actually, you are talking about scan. Someone is reading something completely different. Uh, so it's important to, to, to have this, uh, this definition of one image. And then there is the unit. So for example, uh, uh, physician were, uh, physicists sorry, were, were thinking about like high frequency and everything. So they were thinking in Earth, uh, while the most American people are talking about period with the repetition time. So, uh, so the idea is that trying to uniformize this is, is really a good practice and it makes like, for example, the paper more readable and everything. So you have to agree on the terms. Then the main uh, component of the bits directives are the structure. So it starts with a project, so that is quite classic. Uh, and then we have this like source data folder, uh, which basically, so I, I won't go in detail on this one. It, it's really just uh, what goes out of the, of the machine. So you put everything in your source data and you don't really, uh, there is like no directives on it. It's basically you do whatever you want. What, uh, so what happens is that it's mostly the experimenter when he is like acquiring uh, data, he puts it directly in the, in the source data. Then you have this like raw data folder, which is the standardized one. And the idea is that you have like a translation from source data to raw data to be bit compliant. And the idea is that you have a lot of tools uh, to do this. You don't want to do it yourself. You will see why. Uh, and, and, and this way you can ensure that the raw data is really, really compliant. Finally, you have the derivatives. And again, so this is more for the analysis. I won't go much in detail, but the idea is that you will have like nested uh, uh, bits. So you have your uh, structure and actually any analysis is decided that you perform a process on one image. For example, a registration that we introduce, uh, or you can like regress, you can filter. And it's always something that you apply on one image. Uh, bits helps you to address all your image. So you can like parallel process them, you can batch process them. And the idea is that you will go from one bit to the other, and then you will apply the, the next step and the, the, the output bits, which becomes the new output bits, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is then the derivative. Uh, what I will focus on is this like raw data uh, folder, which is the, the kind of the, the raw uh, uh, data set. So within this folder, actually, you have like quite uh, a constraint, which is that uh, only three uh, file formats are accepted uh, in the case of neural imaging. Uh, so we have this like uh, nifty file. So basically, it's the same uh, example as I showed you uh, earlier. Uh, just to show you again, it is not that trivial. It's that actually in like 30 years, we had like load of way to encode uh, MRI. So these are all the same images. Just each software has its own way to like uh, encapsulate it. Um, basically, the idea is that you have this like header. Uh, I mean, this was the former uh, format when you were, you had like two files per image, one header for the metadata, and then one image uh, file for the actual image. Uh, so they merge everything together with the Nifty, and this is now the reference uh, uh, format. But again, so. So many options, just at some point, you have to choose one. Actually, it's not necessarily one. So if you look at the example of the uh, bits for EEG, uh, because people were not able to agree, everybody was using something different, they accepted to have like many different formats uh, allowed by the, by, by the bits. Then you have this like uh, tabular data. So you have like two uh, applications. Uh, for physiological uh, data, so I was talking about tracking. So this is something that you can start in a simple table. 
uh, and they thought the CSV because it's text based and you can open it and read it like uh, it is like a, a system independent so it is quite convenient and the other thing are like iterative metadata so if you have a, a, a folder with like a, a list of files uh, you can uh, attribute metadata for each of the file easily thanks to the pillar uh, data. so that's why they accepted this one and finally there is the json file which is like a descriptive file so again we don't have to go in the detail but the idea is that you can store structurally uh, and these are the only three that are uh, that are accepted so this way you have like a minimal complexity you just have three uh, three type of, uh, uh, of files uh, and the metadata, I think this is the most important, is tech based, so it is like system independent, and also it is human readable. And this is one of the key features of JIT. Things have to be understandable by human. By... Then the most important concept are for the, probably the, the file names. Uh, so basically, the problem that you want to solve is this one. Uh, everybody will have like different way of naming this file. And even within a lab, it can be different. Even the same person can switch, for example, from RAT1 to RAT1 without the capital or something like this. Uh, so this is not uh, optimal. Uh, so that's why they, they decided to have like, quite a stringent way to give uh, a file name. So the file name is a chain of entity instance with a suffix and an extension, and that's it. So the chain of entity describes what's in the, the file. Uh, and uh, actually, the, the, these are the semantic link. So, for example, there is one which is for the subject that you are imaging, there is one for the session that you are doing, or for the test that you do. So, these are the classical ones. You have like a few other ones. If you reconstruct your file, then you will be re reconstruct. And the idea is to uh, uh, formalize, to crystallize this like semantic link that helps you to structure the data set. Uh, for example, for first, we have to create a new entity because we have like a weird way of positioning the, the probe. Uh, and we had to put that in the file to be sure that we don't lose information uh, when we generate a data set. Uh, so the idea is that the name actually encodes also some of this constraint. Then we have the suffix, which is basically the modality that you do. So for uh, MRI, you have PERL, CBD, uh, then you can have EG or MEG. Uh, for first, we went to something different because for us, what is critical is the dimensionality of our data. So we never know when we have like a matrix, if it is like 2D, 2DT or 3D, and there is no way to distinguish between like a 2D image in time or any 3D image. Uh, so we decided to put it in the name so to be sure that uh, we, we are not confused. And finally, there is the extension, so it goes back to the, the file format. So in the end, you have these like uh, names, which are a bit long, uh, but they are like nicely designed, so you can read easily. And the, the idea is that when you see a file, uh, a file name, you can infer what's inside. And I think this is the, the key feature, and this is a quotation of the, uh, the directives. This is really something that is important. And for the analyst, it's super cool, because to filter your file, you just have to look for the, uh, the key, and then uh, the value, and you can select all the 2D first. You can select like, uh, all the images from the right one uh, with the parser uh, quite easily. So it brings us back to the hierarchy. So we had this problem, like uh, which one do we take? So again, this, this is the one that we, we took. So we select just a few uh, semantic links. So the notion of subject, session, uh, data type, uh, and images. So in the end, your, uh, your, your, your folder looks like this. You have uh, your data set. Then you will have one folder per uh, uh, subject, one folder per session for this subject. Uh, and in the end, uh, you can acquire different type of image during the session. Uh, there is one folder which are like again uh, uh, imposed by the by the DRT. So now that we uh, we have this, this notion of hierarchy, there is a, a key feature which is the inheritance principle, which is actually intrinsic to this uh, this way of describing data. Uh, just to illustrate the idea is like how do we define the metadata and at which level? Uh, so the idea is that you can define the sex of an individual at the individual level. So for example, in this case, sub zero one is, is a female. And if you define it at this level, it will apply to everything which is below in the tree. So this is the inheritance principle, so it is quite, uh, quite general. Uh, now, if you define it at the level of the data set, all the images are going to be uh, assumed to be female. And then, hopefully, you can also bring uh, exceptions. We can say, all right, at the data set, all the individuals are female, except like the subject two uh, with a male. And then uh, you change the, uh, the meaning of, uh, uh, of the image. If, for example, your subject changed sex during the, uh, during the, the two sessions, uh, you, you, you can like, raise another exception at another level. Uh, so basically, if we get back to uh, this example, there is a single way to describe this, uh, which will be to define the session A, A as treatment one and session B as treatment two. 
and then you define the sex of your uh, individuals and you have uh, formally described this, uh, this structure. So to summarize your, uh, your business data set, uh, should look like this with your three main folder. Uh, within it, uh, you have this like hierarchy, which is defined subject, session, and uh, data type. Uh, and finally, the directives tell you who uh, and which metadata you want to store and at which level you can do it with like specific files uh, that you can apply at uh, any level of the hierarchy. So there is like one direct problem is that usually data sets are quite big and not super appealing. Uh, so this is an example with only like two subjects and in total three imaging sessions, and you have like quite a bunch of files. So that's that's one of the, the, the complaints about, uh, about bits. But you know that this is like complete. So uh, you can send it to someone, you will be able to, to, to make sense uh, uh, of the data. So there is like a trade-off here between like, um, uh, and the idea is always redundancy bits constraints. Uh, so in the end, our standard is defined by this terminology, the structure, which is equal to the hierarchy. Uh, the file names is an important uh, uh, constraint, and then the metadata is more like up to you which metadata you want to put in it. Uh, I will just want to go back to the file names uh, to make this transition to our documentation. Uh, so what we saw is that actually names are quite deterministic thanks to this tool. If you look at one uh, file, you can know what's inside just by the name. There is just one little uncertainty I will go back uh, very soon, uh, which is the, the, the session. So we will defend the session. Uh, but you know that, I mean, as long as you image the rat one, the name should be rat one. Uh, if it's like a two diffus, so this type of acquisition, it's going to be like the, uh, this in the name. So for the experimenter, it's really like uh, uh, easy. Uh, there is no like question. Uh, oh, shall I name the file at the end of the experiment? And this disambiguate a lot of things. In the end, your name file encodes your experimental plan. Uh, and this is like critical because it, uh, it allows us to go back to the, the, the beginning, which is that when we do this like uh, deductive process, the hypothesis is encoded in the experimental plan or the experimental plan translates the hypothesis that you make. And then you generate a data set, which means that actually when you have an hypothesis, Basically, you have defined, designed also directly your structure. And if you apply the bits uh, uh, directives, uh, you can like, literally generate your, uh, your data uh, structure and then populate it the, during your experiment. And what's interesting is that it goes the other way around. When you start to think about building your data set, you will start to question uh, your experimental design. And this is the notion of session, for example, uh, which can be useful. So here we are more like in the bits hack. So how can we optimize the use of bits uh, for us, and the idea is that you will start to question what are my group actually, because I will have to find a name for the session that define my group. So I will give you an example. But uh, basically, by carefully defining your uh, session names, you can plan your experiment, and after that, you can facilitate your analysis. And so this is more like, again, personal. Uh, so we decided to give a sense to the name of the session, so it's not part of the directive. Uh, that's more like a convention that we applied, for example, in my lab. Uh, so we decided to give sense uh, to the label of the, of the session. And this way, you can parse super easily, even across data sets. So the idea is that uh, I was doing pharmacology. So here, we tested like the treatment of uh, psilocybin, for example, one milligram per kilogram. Uh, and and we, if we enforce the fact that we also keep in mind which session it was, so this was the second session uh, the animal was going through, this one, the third one, uh, you can answer many questions super fast. So you just have to, to look, for example, if your question is, is there a difference between male and female at baseline? And you just have to parse your data for this and you have the result uh, immediately. This only constraint is that you have to initially think what are the parameters that are interesting to, uh, to think about. And this is like proper experimental planning. And this is like uh, ameliorating a bit the way also you design your experiment and, and build your hypothesis. So this brings us to the convention, which is at some point you also have to think in advance, do your experimental planning, and potentially you want to add constraints to yourself to facilitate the sharing in the end. Which basically you create a convention. In the end, if the convention is well adopted, it becomes a standard. So there is also this little distinction. So an example of convention, the notion of common space. Uh, so as I told you, we are doing like 2D imaging. So we image slices of the brain. Uh, if you are fancy, you can actually move the probe uh, and image like multiple uh, places in, in the brain. But as you can see, there are like scarcity, there are like holes in our images. Uh, so if you are like really fancy, you spend some time and you have like a dense 
scanning of the brain. So this is the classical way that you would do in MRI, for example. You, you get like a, a, a dense volume. And if you have like a reference space, your image will look like that. So for example, here we can see that there is like a little pitch angle between the images. Uh, but this is not really a problem because we're going to like sample our images, uh, which look like this. We can register then our image back to the reference space. And when we resample our image on the reference space, actually, the intersection between both uh, is still dense. So we still have like an image which is dense and we can like uh, overlay on, uh, on our reference. That's, that's what is basically done. For us, when we have like this scarcity, uh, it is more annoying because we have like a lot of holes in our data. So when we do the registration, actually, we see that uh, our, uh, our slices are tilted. And then when we look at the resampling of our data, what we see is that the intersection between two slices uh, is a single line. And this can be like really annoying. So the idea is that when we will try to compare data sets which are acquired with different angles relative to the problem, uh, then we're going to have like a problem because we cannot uh, compare them. And so what is the point of sharing data if you cannot uh, compare them? Uh, so for the comparison of this sparse data, uh, it's at, at the acquisition level. So the experimenter uh, must agree on like some kind of reference, which will be like super uh, drastic because you have to image in this and there is like no way to go back. Uh, and this is a bit the notion of convention. So it's this idea that as people want to share data at some point, we also have to agree that sometimes it comes with a constraint. You can't force it in a, in, in a standard because you don't want to constrain the experiment. So this is something that you have to do uh, one, one, one layer more, uh, which is to constrain yourself to be sure that actually you are understandable by, by everybody and then you can compare things. Uh, and this choice must be made at, at the community in this case. So there is this idea that without talking, there is no sharing. You really have to think in advance what you want to do, uh, and you have to agree at the, uh, at the community level to do that, and this is the notion of convention. All right, to, to, to summarize uh, a bit everything, so that are hub in the scientific reasoning. So there are like pivotal between different types of reasoning. Uh, as such, uh, with the development of technology, there are like good reasons to, to share them, and these are like scientific reasons. Uh, BIS is a good tool to facilitate the curation uh, and therefore ultimately to, to, to facilitate the sharing of data. Uh, inversely, when you start to standardize your data, it can also help you in the reasoning. You will like formalize what is your hypothesis. Beyond the standard, there are also like conventions, and, and this must be done at the, at the community level. And these conventions can leverage significantly your science through the community you are working with. So that was a bit like uh, my message. Uh, and to finish, so here is my motto uh, stop wasting your data and start to structure them. Thank you so much, Jean Charles. We are a bit of um, out of time, so I will yeah. propose to, it was very interesting, but I will propose to do in this way. So maybe who wants to ask question can write in the chat or we can have a discussion at the end if you have more open questions. So the speaker Luigi or Jashar can answer directly in the chat. And so in this way, we can move on to the next speaker <laughs> without too huge delays. Um, so. In the next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Elena Driosti. Uh, Elena is a principal investigator at UCL, working uh, with Zipperfish on social behavior in health and disease. She's also the executive director of the Kayal uh, Advanced Neuroscience Training Program, and she has developed uh, NeuroKids, uh, which are a new series of highly scalable and hands-on courses on fundamentals of neuroscience, which will be the topic of today and to which we also had the chance to participate uh, a few months ago. So please, uh, Elena, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Matilda. Can you me can you all see my presentation? Yes, we can. Is it? Yeah, okay. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for inviting me here. I think it's really great to be able to spread the news about the Nero kids. And uh, secondly, I think it's great that I'm coming after Luigi and Jean Charles because uh, I think if we were in a room with the audience, what I would ask everyone is like to raise your hands if you feel like you can use very easily the tools that they just presented or instead you feel like you're not empowered to use them or how many of you feel like you know you should need a lot of training before you feel like confident to use them 
And I feel like this is basically what I want to discuss today and what I want to convey, which is like, we see training as the bottleneck for the progress in neuroscience. And so what we have right now is a lot of technology and what we don't have, we're not doing correctly is basically allowing everyone to be trained in the best way, in the best possible ways so that we can produce high quality science and uh, make progress in neuroscience. And that's basically what I would like to be like the take home message of my talk today. So before I, let's see if I can move to the next, oh, our screen is just frozen, sorry. Let me just, can you still see it in presentation or not? We see the presentation with all the slides, so the... Okay. Let me see if I can, okay, good. Sorry, okay. It's not going forward. Um, so today, before talking about the NeuroKids, I just want to quickly introduce how we got there. So a brief introduction about what's the SCAL program. And then uh, I want to conclude by allowing you to understand how you can also contribute, how you can be involved, and how we can work together towards uh, creating a NeuroKid curriculum. So um, the CAL program is basically a um, training hub. It started as a European training hub. And the mission is literally to try to uh, train the young generation of neuroscientists by using ex hands-on experimental, an experimental way to teach. So it's not just lectures, it's really project-based and like hands-on experiments. And um, it has been uh, uh, funded in 2015, and again, by five different partners with uh, mainly the idea to provide high quality training and to be a sort of a response to uh, the Cold Spring Harbor courses. So there's high quality courses that were already present in US and we didn't have in Europe. And um, it's located, its courses are located in two major venues. So we have one uh, in Bordeaux in France and the second one at the, in Lisbon at the Charles Polymer Center for um, the Unknown. And the reason why we pick those two venues is because they really have state-of-the-art facilities for training students. And of course, they're located in a great uh, place and it's very uh, great to be there for either if you're teaching or if you're basically um, receiving training. And um, again, so the reason why we developed this course is, is because we really want to have hands-on training. So as you can see here, this is just a simple structure of one of the three-week courses. And you can see that in green, you have the lectures, in blue, you have student projects, and in gray plus sparkle, you have what is social networks and uh, extra days for you where you can uh, do some networking. So the lectures are just in the morning and they're very few. And uh, again, it's because the core part of these courses starts in the afternoons and uh, during the in-between days of the lectures where each student basically can select the project that they really want to follow up and uh, work on in this usually two blocks of 10 days during the course. And uh, there are many projects and these are discussed within, uh, within the students. And uh, the other side of these courses, which is really, really important, and the reason why these courses they work, is because there is a lot of networking. You are in an amazing location with amazing experts in neuroscience in different areas, and you are also surrounded by students that have been selected. So there are all of ten, of outstanding students. So the best is basically to enjoy to have this immersed experience where you, yes, you train, you get received training, but also you network with uh, um, the faculty. And um, so usually the CAL offers six courses per year. So they are spread over a, a variety of different techniques and also different uh, research fields. And some of them, they are always the same. For instance, the computational courses or other courses on like the machine learning, but others, they vary depending on the, on the demand. So I just want to finish here to talk about uh, what the CAL offers in terms of on-site courses established, but I really um, urge you to look it up the website and to subscribe to our uh, newsletter. And also, if you have an idea for a course you want to uh, suggest, or if you want to train um, uh, some students, please do um, let us know. So when I basically joined this CAL program, what I wanted to do is not just train 20 students or 24 students in one course, but the idea was like, I felt very frustrated that many of them, if we receive 200 applications are not allowed to participate to these courses and can clearly not be there. So what we asked them is like, can we do something? But even more 
or even before doing this, we ask ourselves, okay, is there really this need for training neuroscientists? Is it just us as uh, trainers that we believe that, oh, everyone should be trained? And uh, so what we did, we basically run a survey that we ran last year uh, by a fence. And then we ask everyone to join and to say, okay, what do you think? Do you really need, do you think there is a need for training? And we ask students and we ask PIs and everyone. And uh, the reply is, is basically yes. So the majority, clearly, it doesn't matter if you're a student, it doesn't matter if you're a postdoc or even a PI, you do want to have more training. So everyone feels like the technology is clearly ahead of us and we do all need training. And this is like a lifelong experience. So it's not just once that you want to, you need training, it's something that you need all along your career. And then interestingly, what we ask also is, how do you want, what's the format? How do you want this teaching to be conveyed? And um, the reply is basically not just on-site courses, like we thought at the beginning, everyone wanted to have like a personal experience, but everyone now is basically okay to have a mixture of online and on-site courses. And then when we ask what's the perfect time, pretty much almost everyone decided, oh, one week is enough time to get a crash course on something and basically not lose much time um, away from the lab. So um, what we decided to do is like, uh, okay, these are the replies. So how can we go from like six courses per year, 20, 24 students to many more students? So clearly we cannot offer on-site courses. So we came up with an alternative that we decided to call NeuroKids. So what are exactly these neuro kits? So these are one week long courses. And the basic idea is to keep what's the core of the CAL program, which is exactly this hands-on experience where you really learn by building something and uh, to put all the materials that you need to have this hands-on experience in a box and then to ship them all over the world such that everyone could have the same equipment, they could receive the same training from the same people. And so this, as you can imagine, becomes way more affordable and also way, way more scalable. And that's basically what we want to have, something, some training that could be applied to many more uh, neuroscientists. So what we did so far, and this is by far my favorite slide, is that we have already run these courses and we have shipped uh, these neuro kits all around the world. And uh, here you see some students. So we asked them to take a picture, a selfie of um, their kits, and uh, they have been super successful. And so um, this is how they work. So this is the structure. So um, in order to have them more scalable, what did we study to do? And also because we wanted to um, provide this to different time zones, we had recorded lectures in the morning. So we have, we asked uh, faculty to record the best lecture they could possibly have. And then uh, in the afternoon, so everyone gathers on a platform and then there is the part where you can receive uh, the tutoring with uh, the faculty. So I'm sorry for that one. So um, the first, the morning, what you can have is basically, these are not just the usual lectures that someone would record. So you would just like listen to someone and then uh, you just like end up with a piece of knowledge about something. So yes, there are some lectures that are purely, uh, someone is talking about some theory, but also we have tutorials where someone is explaining step-by-step step how a software, how you can do something with a software. And we also have hands-on instructors where you just watch a video where someone is literally explain to you step by step how you connect cables and wires, how to build something. And then uh, in the afternoon is basically what we call um, the personalized um, experience where what you do is basically you connect from anywhere you are and um, someone which is an instructor will basically be responsible for your training. So you will have some worksheets that you have to go through in an afternoon. And then uh, we divide all the people, all the students in small groups. So usually we have a ratio of one to five um, between the instructor and students. And then uh, they will basically go together um, through, the, um, uh, through the worksheets. And the way we allow this is by using Discord, which is nothing else than an online platform where you have different channels such that you can, for instance, speak only to a person, an instructor, you can post your images, you can uh, have a video chat such that you can troubleshoot, for instance, why um, your cables, they don't work or your electric system doesn't work. 
So what do we have right now? So this is how the New York kids work. So it's one week crash course uh, on uh, recorded lectures in the morning and the afternoon we have tutorials. And uh, at the end of um, the, the one week course, what we ask students is basically to focus on one topic and then to produce uh, one slide that is basically their project so that they can show what they have achieved. So these are for now the New York kids that we have. So we started in 2021 and now we are probably have um, four different New York kids courses. And I'm just gonna show you um, a few examples of these courses. So the first one, which is I think that to do for every single neuroscientist is the bootcamp on experimental neuroscience. And so what we do, we basically uh, put in a box all the components to learn about how a computer works, how you can program, how sensor works. And uh, for me, what it is highly rewarding. And so this is just an example of um, the parts that you get. Um, so it, what's highly rewarding is that every single person, depending or participant, depending on how, what their basic knowledge, they do achieve much different, very different uh, outputs. So you have students so they are they are just start from nothing and they manage to build a robot that can follow them or responds to um, some kind of like color. So whatever they decide. And some there are some others that instead they do way more with a robot. And so this is just an example of few robots that from students that we had in the past. And uh, one of the key components of this near kids is basically you learn while having fun. So, which is basically one of the best ways to have something that remains in your mind and you really understand how things work. And uh, again, just to show you an example. So these are three examples of students projects. So you have, for instance, this robot here that follows the face, recognizes the face of the students and follows her around. You have this other um, student that she managed basically to recognize um, when the motion and uh, do the robot basically moves left and right so she can give the robot commands. Or you have another robot here that basically uh, moves and recognizes um, the person that is moving. So then we have a second course, which is the extracellular electrophysiology acquisition. So it's basically about teaching uh, a student how do you build an electrophysiology um, circuit. And uh, again, it's very simple, but even people that have been uh, recording for years, they found it extremely gratifying and extremely useful because if you don't understand how a circuit is built, what, what is an amplifier and how you can reduce noise, basically you cannot do uh, way there are things that are many more, more complicated. So again, so the circuit is very simple. So what we ask students is basically to uh, build a system and then to record EEGs, for instance, or to record their heart rate. And again, so for the students, it's really a lot of fun and they learn. And um, as I was saying before, so some students, they just manage to understand what is noise, how you can filter it, such that it's basically necessary to do. Um, um, if you work with uh, this study electrophysiology. And some students even went farther. So for instance, this is an example of a student that created a, a game. And uh, we use this, for instance, to uh, showcase, uh, showcase our uh, neuro kit and it has been a lot of fun. So what do we do? And I put it here just because the main point is that you kind of like, the idea is to empower students to understand, okay, what are your signals? What are you recording and how can you use them? So you can't just, the reason why you can just like put, connect a brain to a USB cable and, and get all the data is because there is something in between. There are electrical signals and that's uh, what you need to understand. We have a third course, which is on uh, um, a software, a visual software that is open source, like all our other partners. Um, and uh, it's called the Bonsai software. And the reason why we chose this program to is mainly because it can be integrated with many other open tool sources. And, uh, but it's also because it's a software that allows you to build a behavioral rig. And to, if you're doing any kind of experiment that is related to building a behavior and be able to, for instance, um, find a feature of your animal that could be like, whisker that could be a pose and connected to something that needs to happen, for instance, press a lever or recognize um, 
some uh, kind of behavior, that's the software that you want, or at least it's one of the softwares that you want. And so what we basically do in this course is teach students how you can, again, be in power and, you know, do exactly answer the question that you want to answer. So you have a behavior, you have a question, and now it is how you can do it. And the last um, new kit that we develop is the modern approaches to behavioral analysis that again relies on an open source tool. In this case, it's a software, the Deep Lab Cat. And uh, what it does basically allows you to extract features from behavior very with using machine learning tools. And uh, for me, the beauty of, again, using and sending kits all over the world is that we had students that they use not just mice or the usual animal models, but we had like elephants, we have crabs, we have rhinos in Africa. So we have a lot of different videos. And this is basically when you realize that you're doing the right thing because it's like you have a game changer for those students that really would have had no idea on how to extract, extract this data. So where are we right now? So we have this four courses. Where are we going? The idea is basically to um, create a curriculum. So what we want to have is basically we do want to provide a foundational curriculum for young neuroscientists. So we know, as I told at the beginning, that technology is not constant, it's constantly evolving. So what we want to create is, first of all, four pillars of knowledge of training. And we want to provide to every young neuroscientist a toolkit that they can start and need to use uh, when they start their neuroscience career. So with this four blocks that we created, and I just discussed with you, we have um, the bootcamp, we have open EFIS, electrophysiology, we have one on behavior, and we have one on machine learning. So the plan is now to combine uh, computational tools and then to create one more course on optics. And so this is basically what we call it the core foundation of neuroscience. And then on top of this, we will have more advanced courses that will depend basically on new expertise that we feel like students need to acquire. And so I just want to end basically um, discussing and opening mainly a discussion about like how you can contribute and what you can do. And so what we realized while we were running this course is that most of the students, they don't just join alone and uh, they basically join together. So we had students here and uh, they laughed and uh, the amazing atmosphere that you create while you're running these courses, it's literally when you have a group of students, they do together and they work together. And when you're there as a TA, as an instructor, you sometimes you're there and you feel like you are not even needed because there is this like crave for learning um, on your own. And so what do we want to do? And uh, what we're looking for right now is basically universities, PhD program, master students, and uh, institute, they really want to uh, partner with us and they want to say, okay, I do want to run a course on two of these topics, three of these neuro kids every year, and such that we can have basically together with them a partnership. And so what we're going to have is like instructors that now join online, and then locally you would have this students that either students with some poser, they would take the course together. And of course, these uh, groups of students will be connected by a platform to the central, um, to the experts or the central organization. So I just want to finish here saying like, uh, please do get in touch because we're now at a point where we're really looking for a university and group of students where that it can help us not just to uh, take the course, but also to give us, provide us feedback. And we're really, we really think like there is a niche for and the need to create a curriculum that is like an international curriculum where we can really provide the same high quality of training and keep it updated to many, many neuroscientists. And I just want to finish here. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Elena. A wonderful talk. Is there any question? Or comment or whatever? Because otherwise I will try to break the ice. And I have a few questions actually. And one of these is just relating to the last part of your talk. So uh, in this partnership that you are trying to, um, to, to build, since we, we also had this experience of organizing these courses, in which way or which is your plan to 
uh, organize the, the the possibility to have some teaching assistants that will be either trained or will all, always in time be trained because maybe people around the uh, research centers changes moves a lot so how will you um, um, try to maintain uh, have a continuity in the training with partnership for example yeah, so what we're trying to do is to have someone still from uh, the central organization that is available to uh, the partners. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to run one of the senior kids per year, but the partners, they would not have to join at that time. So what's going to happen, they could organize the local courses whenever they want, and they would just be assisted by online TAs. Or if they want to, they the person that they want to have as local organizer would be okay. trained by us. And that's how we we're basically going to continue to keep the standards and also to train the local people. And the advantage is basically that we would provide the uh, near kits for cheaper, uh, for lower costs, because it, with um, for so if a partner basically joins for at least two courses, then it would be much cheaper for us and it could be cheaper for the partner to ship everything. And um, that would be also the advantage. Thank you. And I have a, another um, another question, which is more broad. I don't know if you have any uh, ins on it, but uh, so what you said at the beginning is very, um, or maybe there is something from the chat before me starting to speak. Oh no, it's the sync of it. So, um, so using these open tools requires training. And I think it's something that we really feel every day. Like you have this possibility of using these very cool and open tools, but you need to be educated. But, and this is something mandatory in open to, uh, in order to promote this kind of culture. Did you notice any kind of uh, an effect of open science uh, culture on the participants of NeuroKids or an increase in the use or more discussion or effects of this kind of initiative that um, so may be I framed. personally so I'm someone that I'm clearly pro open source in the sense that I I mean the microscope that we build here we build them and um, but again so you can build things and you can use open source only if you fully understand what's in there what's the black box however i also feel like you know there are some times when you don't have all the, the time to spend and to dedicate um one year to build something so i think like there will be always a combination between open source tools where someone that has the time can implement with some other less open source tools with that provide you something that is like a quick way to do some science so i don't think this is gonna disappear i think like the two there is an equilibrium between the two which depends on like the demand and what you want to achieve so for sure the more training we provide the more people we're gonna have that they are able and capable to do and to shift towards open tools and to create their to be able and to be in control of what's in the black box even in on something on the tool that is not fully open source Thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, I would have a question for the first two speakers. It's a generic one. Um, so I, I really like the both of the talks because I think they they kind of uh, um, tackled the the problem of uh, interoperability into different ways one with a package another with like a, a way of thinking at the data and uh, and um, a standard schematization for the data and my point or my question would, uh, would be whether uh, your kind of your uh, fixed points or your starting points to make uh, these uh, two uh, interoperable uh, tools were more like scientific, so you start from uh, uh, something related to, to your scientific goals, or uh, uh, it was more like, uh, okay, I have this kind of uh, data, which technically come from uh, the machine in this way, uh, so I need to build a tool which uh, helped me solving a technical problem rather than a scientific one. I don't know if it was clear or not. So uh, if I got the answer correctly and I can try uh, like the question correctly and I can try an answer. Um, in my case, it was mostly driven by 
the necessity of using tools that were out there um, on different kind of data and like kind of uh, over overcoming these gaps that there can be between communities uh, where like tools in one community developed in one community would not reach a different slightly different community I mean this was still system neuroscience we are not uh, that gazillion people but still many times we do something and just because of how it's taught it it remains limited to one very specific application just because we are not kind of making the very small step of thinking broadly that about the fact that this can be uh, useful to more people than we actually um, think about. So in my case, I was thinking, okay, there is this nice tool. I cannot use it on my data at the moment. Uh, I can find a convenient way to make this tool not only working on my data, but working on uh, like in a way less specific way for many other people too. Um, and so, yeah, that was it. So it was yeah the necessity of using a tool that then triggered the the idea of generalization. Yeah, so so for me, I think it would be uh, the same. So basically, as I told you, uh, we are starting from scratch. So I didn't even thought about it, and I decided that you always generate data set, and actually, as long as the information is on your computer, you have a structure. So I was facing this problem that every time I was doing something new, I was inventing a new structure, kind of, because uh, we never knew where we are heading for. And that's one day I got this like uh, presentation on this. I was like, uh, so it was more like there was this background problem. I knew it was a problem, but uh, I didn't formalize it. And some people were discussing this like uh, data structure. I was like, okay, that's that, that's cool. That that's pretty much what I would like to do. Uh, and then I realized that as usual. It is more complicated than I expected. Uh, and then I faced like all, all, all the challenges. And then I realized like, okay, that's also actually something interesting for uh, for really thinking your experiment and having this like a more holistic uh, uh, point of view. But, uh, yeah. but if I can add something, I think that um, in the, in this context, also, also like the work that uh, the NeuroKit kind of dissemination of practices is doing, um, I think it will be helping a lot this kind of interoperability and this 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 kind of this way of thinking because yeah I think that what like the main reason why we reinvent the wheel so many times and we operate in such such a like divided way is because there is not that much space for sharing practices and not only scientific data and conclusions like we think a, a lot about communicating our research. But there is no focus on really uh, like sharing approaches and tools and having something like a global, like a, a common curriculum, like uh, as I don't know what I was saying. I, I think it's a super nice idea that will also help a lot in making more people think about how can how what they are doing, how much is similar to what other people are doing, and how many solutions are there already being developed. In, uh, like for for solving very similar problems so um it was yeah i, I i've yeah i very like this approach and i have high hopes on the fact that we can continue yeah, i would i would just add uh, yeah, yeah go ahead sorry yeah sir i have a question for luigi about masks right and maybe comparison on like um, in between species like uh, in a sense like if you have already some masks that you know or if you know already the brain of in this case a mouse right an adult mouse there is a lot in terms of like where where is this area in the brain and has been very well documented but what happens with brains where you don't have like, you know, if you are in between, like, along the development or, like, juvenile, for instance, zebrafish, and you don't have really this nice masks, is there anything you can do in terms of, like, going from using, so how would you build a mask, right? Do you have to have a guess and that's all of this base, or can you make a comparison in between different brains? Yeah, so this is, yeah, um, all kind of very debated issues in the, in, in the field of, like, neuroanatomists who are now trying to from on developing those, those, those atlases were in our case, we have the very simple kind of naive idea that once you define a, an atlas, one voxel is one box, like it has to belong to one region. Um, 
which of course can be a fuzzier concept and especially like people that are developing the like in, in the case of the allen brain atlas i don't know how much people are asking those questions and how much debate there is in the community i know that in the community of zebrafish that have been developing the at like the zebrafish atlas that is currently available there are a lot of those considerations and they are thinking like i know when i left they were working and thinking about kind of a fuzzy boundaries for brain regions that would allow kind of uh overlapping uh, like giving probabilities of like one voxel leave voxels to be not entirely in one area but being in one way, area with certain amount of of uh, certainty um at the moment we don't have uh support for this kind of fuzziness in our in our structures but if because we are actually not aware of an atlas where this is already implemented but if the if someone starts moving toward this this notion of uh fuzzy boundaries for brain regions in a, an implemented atlas we can think of supporting them somehow super thanks if i can uh, jump on this question i have another question for you uh, luigi which i think it would be of general interest here for example uh Chimek and manifactura so Mm, for the registration of experimental samples to these atlases, uh, is there any constraint for the acquisition of these samples? How flexible is um, this tool? Do we require specific methods instead of others? Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the the atlas distribution tool is actually not uh, like it, it is not what is taking care of registrations. Like it's more a back end that is serving atlases to registration tools um but the registration tool that i mentioned uh like there are some registration tools that people can potentially use and the kind of data and the, the considerations that they have to do when generating their data actually depends on kind of the software they end up using brain rag which is the software that i mentioned is actually specifically targeted at three-dimensional data so uh, you can use it to register volumes to volumes uh, but there are also tools that are being developed, like this ABBA, like there is a, a tool that has been developed for registering slices, um, which is at the moment is uh, like run on ImageA, so not strictly Python, but there are ways of using their atlases distributed through, um, through brain group. So uh, in that case, it is also possible to register uh, single slices. Uh, the tool has been developed on mice data, um, but yeah, there is no re reason why it cannot, in principle, work on other kind of data. Uh, the images specifications that you would need to to have depends on the atlas that you're referring to, and yeah, try to tinker with the software and see. But it is possible to register, in principle, also slice data and not only volumetric uh, volumetric data. Thank you so much. Um, if there are, are not other questions, uh, we can take maybe five minutes of break and um, see again you in uh, five minutes at 10 past five. Okay, see you.
Okay, so I think we can start. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Ryan Lee. Um, Ryan Lee is a scientific data engineer in the machine learning and analytics group at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He works on developing and maintaining neurodata without borders and its dissemination to the neuroscientific community. And so today he will speak about this interesting topic. Uh, so please, Ryan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me okay and see yes. my slides? Yes, okay. perfect. Okay, great. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this symposium. I'm a huge advocate for open tools, code, and data standards, especially in neuroscience research. So I'm honored to be here today. Uh, my name is Ryan. I am a neuroscientist and a scientific data engineer at Berkeley National Lab in the United States. And I am the technical lead on the NeuroData Without Borders, or NWB, Open Data Standards Project. Uh, in this presentation, I will tell you about the NWB ecosystem for fair neurophysiology data. Feel free to ask me any questions in the chat during the talk, and I'll try to, to uh, check the chat periodically. Okay, so over the next uh, half hour, I would first describe the motivation of our work. Then I will explain what exactly is NWB, how does it work, and what tools and services are integrated with NWB. Finally, I will point you to resources for you to learn more and get started using NWB in your labs and your data workflows. Okay, so as the field of neuroscience grows and becomes more and more collaborative, uh, more neuroscientists like ourselves are interested in sharing data, collaborating with others, and reusing shared data. Within a lab, sharing data or using shared data uh, enables you to do new science. You can develop and test hypotheses using previously collected data, and you can collaborate with your lab mates to generate insights that would be difficult for you to do alone. Similarly, sharing data with another lab or with the public enables external collaborations, and also you know, that enables new science. And reusing data shared by others maximizes the return on investment of a data set. In many cases, the data that we collect costs years of effort, tons of funding, and the lives of precious research animals. Reusing shared data can allow you to um, test whether a finding generalizes to a, a different experimental setup or brain area diff or different species. It allows us to explore follow-up questions to a study, and reusing shared data allows us to develop and evaluate new analysis methods and software tools uh, for personal use or for the community. And all of this also enables new scientific discovery. But you know, let's say that you don't really care about sharing data. Well, you should know that more and more publishers are requiring you to share data upon publication. Uh, and the same goes for governmental funding agencies and nonprofit funding organizations. As of this year in the United States, when you apply for an NIH grant, you are required to submit this data management and sharing policy uh, where you must plan and budget for the management and uh, sharing of data, submit a particular plan for review when applying for funding, and then actually comply with this plan. And this DMS plan must describe what data standards you will use and what data archive you will submit the data to. And this is a pretty strong mandate from the NIH um, and I believe that European governments either have similar data sharing mandates or are planning to institute similar mandates in the near future. So you know, now we have several reasons why we should share and reuse data, uh, but we all know that sharing data and reusing data are both uncommon in our field. This is a reaction diagram with two states, you know, no data sharing and no data reuse on the left, data sharing and reuse on the right. There's a cost or energy required to be in the left state. Doing new science, it's harder and less efficient without sharing or reusing the data. And that ultimately takes uh, more energy than being on the right side, in the right state, where you can easily share your data within your lab, with collaborators, and with the public. You might even reuse some public data. Transitioning from the left state to the right state has a cost or an energy barrier. It takes time and energy to figure out how to share your data and do it well. Now the sticks and carrots that I mentioned, they change the energy required to be in each of these states. 
Funding requirements make it harder to do science without data sharing, and the prospect of new science and collaborations makes data sharing more appealing. But these sticks and carrots do not address the energy barrier here. Now, many of us have experienced this barrier, sharing your data in a format that others can understand, including your collaborators, your lab mates, and even your, your future self. It's hard, it's tedious. You know, what data and metadata about your experiment do you store? What do you name your variables? How do you organize it all? Uh, where and how do you share the data sets? And for, and, and for the PIs in the audience here, how do you pay for that data sharing and storage? And for those interested in you know, data reuse, how do you find, read, and understand data that has been shared by others? One solution for neurophysiology data specifically uh, is NWB and Dandy. NWB provides a data standard, which is simply a set of rules for how to organize experimental data and metadata so that anyone familiar with the standard can fully understand the data. NWB also enables a software ecosystem where a growing collection of processing and analysis tools can use the same data format for input and output. And so you, as a user, you don't need to convert between various idiosyncratic formats making it easy for you to use and reuse data in the NWB format. Uh, the Dandy Archive provides a free centralized cloud-based data repository where you can publish and share your neurophysiology data and find interesting data shared by others. Dandy also provides tools to make it easy for you to upload your data, search for relevant data, and explore and visualize data in the cloud without having to download it. Now, the primary mission of both the NWB and Dandy projects over the next few years is to lower this energy barrier um, of data sharing as much as possible through tooling, outreach, and dedicated support. And we want to make it as easy as possible for you to standardize and share your data uh, to advance scientific discovery. Okay, so now let's step into the details a bit. Uh, again, NWB provides a data standard for neurophysiology data. It supports common types of data and metadata in neurophysiology experiments, including recordings of neural activity via extracellular and intracellular electrophysiology, as well as optical physiology, uh, behavioral responses and video tracking data, information about the data acquisition, such as the settings of your devices and any filtering parameters, information about your experimental design, such as the stimuli that you presented and the trial structure, and information about the subjects that were used, such as their species, genotype, and age. NWB also supports formal extension to allow users to add new data types and modalities not covered by the core NWB standard. So in contrast to neuroimaging data, which has the BIDS data standard that John charles described nicely earlier, uh, in neurophysiology, there's a massive diversity of experiment data, uh, types and data types, and as I will describe later, use cases for this data. And this requires a slightly different, more intricate solution for neurophysiology specifically. One feature of NWB is that it supports all of these different data types that I just described, and it thus enables the unified storage of multimodal data and metadata uh, in both raw and processed forms. So as an example here, you can see a pipeline of an experiment that uses both extracellular electrophysiology and optical physiology to measure neural activity. Using NWB, scientists can store both the raw electrical and optical uh, measurement data, as well as the results from spike sorting and image segmentation in a single file. The community can then build tools that take advantage of NWB's standard structure. For example, uh, this is a screenshot of an interactive dashboard that has loaded data from the above NWB file. On the left, we can see the acquired image and the outline of a segmented neuron. And on the right, we can see the extracellular signal, the extracted spike times, and the simultaneous fluorescence of the segmented region. Users can then scroll through this neural activity over time, and this dashboard here will work with any NWB file that contains both extracellular EFIS and two-photon imaging data. What I've explained so far is NWB as a data standard, but NWB 
it's actually much more than just the standard. It defines an ecosystem of tools, methods, and standards for storing, sharing, and analyzing neurophysiology data. So this diagram here just depicts an overview of the core NWB software ecosystem that uh, our team maintains. At the center is what I described earlier. NWB is ultimately composed of formal definitions of over 60 neuro data types covering most of the neurophysiology space. But how exactly does NWB do that? Um, you know, I will briefly go into the weeds and describe what NWB is and how it serves as the center of this ecosystem. When we were first building this data standard with the community, we encountered a lot of disagreement over what the community wanted the standard to do and look like. Different researchers and tool developers wanted the standard to work best for each of their existing data processes, and those requirements often conflicted with each other. For example, different groups argued over how the standard should be specified, should it be written in you know, plain English such that it's easy to contribute to, or should it be written in a formal specification language that machines can parse? Uh, people argued over what data types to support and how they should be structured, what fields are required, et cetera. People argued over how the data should be stored on disk, a single file, or distributed over the set of files. How should it be optimized for analysis on a laptop or high performance computing or cloud compu computing? And finally, different groups argued over what programming language should be used to read and write the data. You know, this created a challenge for us. And so to serve the diverse needs of the community, we needed to build a flexible framework that supported all these different requirements yet still maintained the concept of a single standard. Uh, and to do this, we broke up all of these, re these requirements into to four parts, the language, the schema, the storage, and access, and uh, presented a solution for each of those. To define the standard, we designed a formal specification language, one that's both machine and human readable. And uh, I won't go too far in the details, but this language uses object primitives, such as uh, groups, data sets, links, and attributes. Uh, that are based loosely on HDF5, a common format for big scientific data. And uh, this, this um, formal language uh, allows the reuse of common data types in an object-oriented manner, so you can extend and uh, extend data types when creating new ones. Uh, because the language is machine-readable, we can build automated tools to validate that data conforms to the standard. And as we'll see in a few slides, we can also flexibly support custom extensions to the standard. We can then use this language to define core data types for neurophysiology. So here is a very simplified example where we define a data type that represents time series data, you know, values that change over time. The time series type consists of data sets called data and timestamps, which are arrays that represent the data and timestamps of a time series. Each of these data sets has an attribute called units, which stores the unit of measurements, for example, seconds or meters. And in this way, any machine or human reading this data will know what unit the data are stored in. They'll know what the variables are called. They'll know what the dimensions and axes are. And they'll have a standard map to get to any particular data set or uh, metadata. Now, this is what I'm describing here is a very simplified version of the actual time series data type in NWB. There's a lot more involved. and NWB also defines over 60 of these uh, neuro data types for the field. At the top level of all of these types is the NWB file neuro data type. Here, NWB specifies a hierarchical organization of raw data, process data, and general metadata. So here is an example of an NWB file with extracellular EFIS data. In the top level general group, you can see information about the experimental subject, the experimenters uh, who did perform the experiment, and the electrodes. In the acquisition group, you can find the raw data. Here we have raw voltage data stored in an electrical series neuro data type, which consists of a two-dimensional array that's timed by electrodes, the corresponding axis values, and metadata about the recording. The electrodes field here references the table of electrode metadata that I described in the last slide. And process data lives in the processing group or the units group. Uh, here, the units group contains a units neurodata type, 
a structured table containing the sorted units, spike times, and features of each sorted single unit. As I mentioned, NWB provides over 60 neurodata types in the core standard, many of which are specializations of the base time series type for different data modalities, like the electrical series or image series types. However, neuroscience, uh, as you know, is constantly evolving. New methods are always being developed. And we want to be able to store data from new methods for acquiring data or processing data. Also, certain data acquisition devices or labs might want to store data specific to that device or that lab. And to cover all of these specialized uh, data types, we created a way for the community to define custom extensions to the standard using the same formal specification language. These extensions can build off of existing neurodata types, for example, by adding fields or refining existing fields. These extensions are packaged with the data, so the data can always be read and understood by both machines and humans. And this is a powerful ability for the standard to support virtually any kind of data that arises. Extensions, they allow the community to define their own data types for their specific lab's needs or to support a new type of data. But we also don't want 20 extensions to do the exact same thing. You know, that defeats the purpose of a data standard. So we created the Neurodata Extensions Catalog where users, uh, you know, researchers, and developers are, are encouraged to share their extension with the broader community and collaborate on its development. So now before a user wants to create an extension for a new data type, they can search the catalog first to see if one exists that fits their needs, and they can work with the developers to uh, add their own use case if it doesn't fit. This catalog also allows us, as the maintainers of NWB, to take note of popular extensions in the community. Uh, we can then work with the creators and the broader community to evaluate whether the extension sufficiently serves a broad set of use cases. And if so, we can then integrate the extension into the core standard and evolve NWB as the community uh, data needs evolve. So in that way, you know, we grow the standard from the bottom up, reflecting the common needs of the community instead of from the top down, such as through a committee, which can only represent small biased parts of the community. So, okay, stepping back to this slide, we discuss ways to address different requirements uh, for the language and the schema, but what about storage and access? We designed, uh, for, for data storage, we designed a flexible framework uh, that dis disentangles how those 60 plus neurodata types and custom extensions are mapped to a storage backend. And we added support for storing data in both the HDF5 and the new ZAR format. Uh, HDF5, it's uh, been around for 20 plus years and supports big scientific data. It's optimized for high performance computing. Uh, however, the data are stored in a big file that makes ac accessing that data on the internet difficult. In contrast, ZAR is optimized for cloud storage and uh, cloud computing, but it can also result in thousands of files, which can generate subpar IO performance on your local disk. In NWB, you can choose which backend you want to use for storing your data, and you can uh, kind of convert between the two easily. Currently, HDF5 is the most popular and widely supported backend, but we're seeing increased interest in ZAR as more computing moves to the cloud. Finally, to support the diverse needs of the community, we need to build user-friendly APIs for reading, writing, and interacting with NWB data so that users, you know, researchers, and developers don't need to worry about all these lower-level storage and language details. So we built the PyNWB software for Python and the MatNWB software for MATLAB. These APIs are interoperable. So NWB files written with MAT NWB can be written can be read by Pi NWB and vice versa, and both APIs support efficient read, write, query, and analysis of NWB, including uh, support for chunking and compression uh, and streaming from the internet and more. In addition, we recognize that getting NWB getting getting your data into the the NWB standard. Is, is a common hurdle. You know, it takes a, a lot of 
um, going through tutorials and reading documentation to do so. And to help with that challenge, we developed a software package called NeuroConv, which can read data from 36 popular neurophysiology data formats and write those data to NWB using best practices. The fact that there are 36 different formats kind of underscores the need for a common standard here. Uh, NeuroConv handles uh, a lot of the finicky bits of data conversion for you, such as loading more data than you have available, uh, RAM on your computer, and automatically chunking and compressing the big data uh, so that uh, it's easily transferred to the cloud or to collaborators. You can also code your own custom conversion scripts using the Python API or the MATLAB API, and we've worked with many labs that prefer to take that approach. Okay, so to summarize this section, to serve the, the diverse needs of the neurophysiology community, we needed to build a flexible framework that supported all of these different requirements and yet still maintained a different standard, uh, a, a single standard. And we did this by designing a specification language that's both machine and human readable, a schema that defines uh, rules for 60 plus core neurodata types and supports custom extensions, a storage framework that allows users to choose between two different storage systems, and API tools for reading and writing data in Python and MATLAB. Okay, so I've described the core data standard ecosystem and how NWB works under the hood. On top of that core infrastructure, we're proud to say that many communities, community software tools and services have adopted NWB as an input and or output format. And these tools allow you, the common neuroscientist, uh, to process, analyze, visualize, and manage your data efficiently and ultimately do better science. Um, so uh, just to, to, to start, we have uh, a number of visualization tools such as NWB Explorer and NWB Widgets that allow you to read and visualize NWB data in, in your browser, in a Jupyter environment, um, in a more interactive desktop environment. Uh, we have, we work with Open EFIS to uh, allow output of NWB data straight from their acquisition system. Uh, we work with DataJoint, which is a, a framework for managing uh, scientific workflows and in a relational database system. We work with the Dandy Archive for storing and sharing NWB data, and I'll get uh, just talk more about them in a second. Uh, we uh, are a supported input and output format for Spike Interface, which is a um, package that allows you to access and run, um, I think, six, seven, eight different spike sorters and compare their performance um, from the same interface and that they support NWB for both input and output. Uh, Neo also supports reading and writing NWB files as well as many different uh, other acquisition system formats. Uh, we work with a number of uh, calcium image analysis Process, um, tools such as Kaiman, Sweet2P, Cheetah, and Extract. Uh, for the intracellular electrophysiology space, uh, the software packages MES and PatchView can uh, read and or write NWB data. Uh, we also have converters for um, the outputs of deep lab cuts and sleep uh, so that you can get those data into a common standardized uh, output form in NWB. And uh, we, uh, well, we um, the pineapple uh, kind of data analysis framework also supports NWB as an input format. By having your data in the common NWB standard, you don't need to convert your data to the specialized input formats for each of these tools. Uh, this allows you to swap out different tools to compare their performance and it allows you to develop a data pipeline that keeps your data in a common standard format throughout processing analysis, visualization, and sharing to the archive. To learn more about all these various tools, both on the core infrastructure side and the community side, um, go to this website, nwb-overview.readthedocs.io uh, to go to links and uh, for each of those tools.
And so you know, what I described here kind of uh, depicts that NWB is at really at the heart of the neurodata life cycle uh, for neurophysiology. It facilitates the flow of data from acquisition to processing to analysis, uh, and then on to publication, preservation, and finally reuse of that data, starting the cycle over again. This means that NWB must support the needs of and integrate with technologies across the data life cycle, um, all of those various tools that I described earlier. And our goal here is to work with and not compete with these existing and emerging technologies. We want to provide a format that allows you to uh, that allows these tools to be interoperable with each other and grants you as a researcher access to all of these tools to serve your scientific needs. Finally, we want to emphasize that NWB it's a data standard for, not a standard of neurophysiology experiments. And what I mean by this is that with NWB, we do not aim to standardize how uh, neurophysiology experiments are done but we aim to standardize how we save and share data from these experiments. Okay, so a core part of the that uh, neurophysiology data lifecycle and the broader software ecosystem is the archive, the data archive. Dandy is the official neurophysiology data archive for the US Brain Initiative, but it's not restricted to labs funded by the Brain Initiative. Uh, anyone can share and publish their data on Dandy. We highly encourage it. It's um, integrated with NWB, and it's totally free. Currently, Dandy has over 200 Dandy sets, and uh, as they call it, uh, data sets on Dandy, and nearly 500 terabytes of data stored. And that's a lot of data. And you can search for particular Dandy sets by keywords, um, authors, or data types. Um, here I'm searching for two photon series and I'm getting a few uh, results from the Microns project or the Allen Institutes. Once you find a dandy set of interest, you can learn more about the experiments and what data are in the dandy set. And then you can download NWB files individually or download the whole dandy set. You know, these dandy sets uh, can get pretty big, tens of gigabytes in many cases. But uh, if you want to access only a small portion of an NWB file, like the information about the subject or the trials, Pi, Pi NWB allows you to stream just those few megabytes of data from the file without, having, without you having to download uh, the whole super big file to your computer. Uh, the Dandy archive also provides free access to a Jupyter Hub instance that can quickly read any NWB file on Dandy. Um, you can, we recommend that you start with a basic Python-based server, the second option, or a basic uh, MATLAB-based server, the last option on the left here, uh, where you have to log into, you know, with the MATLAB one, you have to log into your MathWorks account to use the service due to licensing issues. Um, but all of this is available uh, for you. The, the environment is available for you for free. The Dandy Hub, um, this computing environment, allows you to quickly visualize uh, data in the NWB format that's on Dandy and run simple analyses. So for example, in the figure on the right, I've downloaded, uh, I've loaded up um, an NWB file from Dandy set 54 from uh, Lisa Giacomo's lab. And this file includes calcium imaging data from the mouse hippocampus. And I'm using the NWB widgets tool that I um, mentioned earlier to plot the fluorescence activity from the first 80 ROIs over the first 100 seconds of imaging. Loading this data, generating this plot um, took about 30 seconds in the browser and I didn't have to download a thing. And I can you can see all the different interactive options that you have uh, for navigating this data and the other data that's in that file. Now, Dandy, it has a lot of data in NWB and this is growing by the week. There's currently 100 10, 120 Dandy sets that contain NWB data. And um, given that the Dandy project started only three years ago, I think it's a quite impressive that they've already uh, have, you know, contained over 100 Dandy sets with N NWB data. And this number is increasing quite steadily. Um, these Dandy sets display a large amount of diversity, including in the species of the experimental subject, there's a lot of mouse data, but there's also a good amount of human, rat, and monkey data, 
And we're starting to see data from zebrafish and Drosophila as well. There's a diversity in the modality too, with about 60 of these dandy sets using extracellular EFIS, 20 in optical physiology, and about 20 in intracellular EFIS. These dandy sets vary in data size, ranging from a few megabytes to tens of terabytes. And as dandy becomes more popular, we're seeing more visits to the website internationally and from countries where it might otherwise be difficult to collect or access particular types of data, such as human or monkey electrophysiology data. Together, NWB and Dandy make neurophysiology data meet the FAIR guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship. Now, these principles of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, they emphasize the creation of a data infrastructure that enhances uh, the ability of machines and humans to find and use the data. Uh, and just briefly to, uh, to go over the, these principles and how NWB and Dandy meet them, uh, to address the findable principle data in NWB, they have persistent identifiers and rich keywords and descriptions to make the data findable on the Dandy archive. For accessible, uh, Dandy provides free access to neurophysiology data using the website and also APIs to allow programmatic access. For interoperable, NWB allows you to link data and metadata terms to ontologies and controlled vocabularies, which enhances the richness of the data. And finally, for reusable, NWB requires you to store rich metadata that's essential to understanding the data. And then Dandy allows licensing of that data. And together, these features enable uh, the reuse of neurophysiology data for other purposes. If you want to learn more about this uh, NWB and Dandy ecosystem, I encourage you to check out our eLife paper from last year on this topic. OK, so at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that the primary mission of both the NWB and Dandy projects over the next few years is to lower this energy barrier of data sharing as much as possible. And I've described many ways in which the NWB standard, the Dandy archive, and all of the tooling and services around NWB and Dandy enable data sharing. But tools alone are not enough, as we just learned. Um, we are also focused on providing outreach and dedicated support to help all of you on your journey over the energy barrier. We regularly run online and in-person training events. Um, we have three major events coming up this year. In, at the end of July, we're organizing a, uh, the NWB User Days, a new user training workshop held at um, the Janelia Research Campus in Virginia in the US. And if you want to learn how to convert your data to NWB or use data in the format, we encourage you to come to this three-day workshop. Immediately following that, we have the Developer Days, a hackathon for tool developers to integrate their tools with NWB uh, with help from the core dev team. And finally, in early uh, September, in conjunction with the upcoming IBRO World Confer Congress Conference in Granada, Spain, we'll be hosting our second NeuroData Rehack event. And this is a four-day hackathon for neuroscientists of all career levels to come together and learn how to reuse data from Dandy and uh, to answer whatever questions of interest uh, you have. Um, the, you know, we're not res restricting based on what you what kinds of scientific questions you want to ask. You come with uh, come with your question, come with some ideas of which Dandy sets you want to reuse, and we'll help you on your way. The Kavli Foundation will be sponsoring a special NeuroData Discovery Prize of uh, 50,000 US dollars to fund a small number of attendees to continue work on their hackathon projects uh, for a year after the hackathon ends. And this is a great way for the Kavli Foundation to, uh, to kind of uh, encourage and facilitate the, the last part of the NeuroData lifecycle, which is reuse of data and generation of new scientific insights um, after it's been after the data has been standardized and uh, archived and released to the public. We also provide a wealth of online documentation that you can check out um, from the overview website I linked earlier. And we understand that every lab experiment and data set are unique and have unique needs. And so we also offer one on one consulting and support to labs uh, to help them convert their data and processes to NWB. 
And we offer the same consulting and support to tool developers to add to help them add I.O. support for NWB and their tools. We also create and manage working groups to refine the NWB standard to meet the evolving needs of the community. You know, we want to help, so please reach out to us if you have any questions or need help using NWB or Dandy. All the work on NWB would not be possible without the contributions and support from the community. All of our work is open source, so you're all invited to contribute to the core code base, the documentation, and the working groups to guide the, uh, the evolve evolution of NWB uh, as needs change. And we also want to thank the NIH Brain Initiative, the Kavli Foundation, and the Simons Foundation for funding most of these efforts. Finally, to recap, um, now this is going to go through the whole thing. Uh, we understand that there's a significant energy barrier to go from a state of no data sharing and no data reuse to a state of data sharing and data reuse. And I hope that I've demonstrated you know, first what NWB is and how it serves the diverse needs of the community. And secondly, how NWB and Dandy provide the rules and the tools for how to standardize and share neurophysiology data, as well as reuse existing data to help get the community over this, uh, over to from the left side to the right side of this energy barrier and ultimately improve our science and advance uh, scientific discovery. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Ryan, for this very interesting and deep uh, talk. Um, is there any question? I have a question, if I can. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Ryan, for a very interesting presentation. So I have a curiosity. Uh, you were showing in your slides that also behavioral output can be integrated in this data standard. Can we know something more about that? For example, how adaptable is this data standard for experiments with different maybe species and or different behavioral tasks uh, or something more about the behavioral side? Yeah, uh, that's a good, great question. Um, behavior is a is a challenging area to standardize because there's so many different types of behavior in the field, yeah, sure. tasks, species, et cetera. Um, we, uh, at, a, at a high level, we're able, NWB enables storage of video data, of audio data, of um, spatial data, of, and of other generic time series um, data. And the specifics for a particular task, um, you can kind of work into those existing data types, or you can build an extension uh, to capture additional like rich metadata about those behaviors. And we see that with um, pose estimation uh, data with deep lab cut and sleep, they have particular um, common ways of storing uh, the kind of the, the nodes of a skeleton and and how they evolve over time and the labels uh, associated with them. And we worked with both of them to come up with a common format to, um, to store those data so that you can work with that common format without knowing which software it came from. Um, and so as the community comes to standardize how different experiments are done, we can work with, um, work with uh, those groups and tool developers to, uh, to implement that standard in NWB. Uh, in the absence of that, we provide kind of generic data types uh, for, that allow you to store any, you know, any kinds of behavioral data in the, in the format. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I think there was Elena. Yes, please. Yes, um, I think it's great that people uh, share data. I think it's like, what we should all do. I was just curious about like the reuse of the data and um, like how much uh, are those data? I mean, I'm sure there's gonna be an increase for what you said before for like different pressure, like from the government, everyone to share the data. But I'm just like, I just wanna know like your opinion about like the reuse, like, uh, I mean, in, a, in an ideal world, you know, there will be 
we, we put the data that we can now, for instance, analyze in our lab and uh, someone else could take them and analyze them, someone that has a better expertise and so on and so forth. So I'm just wondering, how are we on this side of the reuse? What do you know? What kind of data do you have? You show a plot where there's an increase of sharing the data. How is the situation with like reuse of the data? Um, I'd say reuse is still very early days. Um, there's a couple examples that we know of uh, that reuse NWB data and have published with it. Um, and that that's fabulous. Uh, I was just at the, the COSIGN conference um, a couple of days ago uh, in Montreal, and uh, the, um, the keynote speaker, Mackenzie Mathis, uh, showed four different instances of reusing data, um, one from the Allen Institute, one from Dandy, one from the, the older CRCNS um, archive, and, and I forget, I think the other was directly from a collaborator. And uh, we're starting to see more and more of this in the community as the data becomes available, especially for those developing tools that they wanna demonstrate the, the use of those tools um, and methods uh, in different types of data. Um, but I agree, you know, the, there, there's more and more data coming into the, the standard and onto the archive but we haven't quite seen as much reuse. And that's that's also why we're hosting this NeuroData Rehack event to um, encourage the community to reuse all this rich data that people have spent lots of money and time and effort to, to collect and could be used for answering uh, different questions of interest. Uh, and so we're trying to get there where there's more reuse, there's more value generated uh, on each data set. And I think that will help um, incentivize others to to put their data into the standard and share it with the community yeah i mean i'm just asking because like i wonder if there would be a better way to increase this reuse so for instance adding tags and uh, i'm saying this because we are trying to create a platform where uh, we have um, mentors, trainers, and on the other side, there are like students, whoever needs to get some feedback or some advice. And I wonder like when you post your data, you would tag it as like, uh, you know, there is a need. So these data, it would be great to find someone with like with someone with this expertise that could help us to mm, yeah. additional data. So because we're like trying to already organize like a website where we can match students or whoever needs some training like or some someone with expertise I wonder if this could be like combined such that you would have like posts like someone that needs share the data but need also this additional step like you would make very clear is there anyone mm -hmm. around there so maybe it would be a possibility we could discuss I think that would be yeah. a way to like you know know at, la at least where is the data and what needs um, to be extracted yeah, that's a great idea and something that um, you know we at NWB and, and our collaborators at the Dandy Archive uh, have only briefly talked about or thought about, um, but it is a common use case that, yeah, there's the, the experimenter has these data, has questions that they don't have time or expertise to answer, and it would be great if someone could could work on that, you know, in collaboration with the, 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 the people who collected the data or even without their inputs. Yeah. Um, there's no place for that in Dandy right now, and so it'd be great to have a, a website or a service to post those um, kind of remaining questions or uh, interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah. I so, yeah love have, to work with you on that. Yeah, I would definitely have a few questions post. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if there are other questions. Uh, I actually had one uh, related to my like the interest in anatomical registrations and anatomical spaces. Um, I wonder whether like there is now or there is a plan to also have some uh, standardization like in this format a way of like annotate also like specifically anatomical regions and like tag somehow describe also the brain space where like this physiology is happening? Yeah, that's a great question and something that we've explored um, and found it to be challenging uh, it, due to the number of different atlases available and ways of 
representing data and transforming between atlases. Um, we have made a little progress in that regard of uh, allowing users to um, associate their XYZ coordinates or whatever coordinates with a standard atlas. Um, but it's it's ongoing work to structure that in a way that can be easily translated between atlases that you that you might provide. So uh, it's we're we're not quite there yet, but we're we have ideas and we're working on it. Yeah, and it would be great to get some of uh, to chat with you about your experience with all these different atlases and how best to construct that and store that within um, NWB. Yeah, I will. I definitely want to discuss this with the like people who are developing it now the mm -hmm. most uh, at SWC. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so if I don't know if there are other questions. Um, Probably I could uh, have another question uh, that uh, it's the, in the sense, let's say I could ask to all the presenters of today, like a sort of um, question to discuss um, together, uh, like a sort of suggestions for younger people. So we have seen the, the importance to approach these, um, um, yes, let's say open science practices and mostly these uh, to use and, and try to use standardized techniques on, on share data formats. Uh, considering your experience, so during the PhD or postdoctor, even as SPI, uh, what kind of suggestion would you give to a PhD students, for example, or postdoc? Uh, working uh, with non-standardized techniques uh, or um, trying to go in this direction for example how long could it take um, to implement these uh, these things and also how did you find support from the co community for example i don't know have you any sort of suggestion i guess i can start um yeah, for for new students and new trainees, or if, if you're just joining a lab and uh, starting your experiments for the first time, we highly I, I, I highly encourage you to um, look into what standards and common tools are available for your particular field and data types. Um, it could be that uh, you don't want to spend two years of your life building your own spike sorter when spike sorting exists already and you just have to get your data into that format and you also don't want to spend you know months converting your data into whatever format that sorter accepts it would be great if that was um, how you store the data in the first place and so it might have some uh, upfront cost to learning about all these different tools and standards and archives uh, but I think it pays off in the long run um, as you get to take advantage of the different tools is you get to fulfill different requirements from funders and publishers that, you know, you don't want to be ready to publish your paper and uh, the journal comes back and says, you have to share your data in a standardized form on the archive. And now you have to spend like a month trying to figure out what parameter did I use for this, uh, this, you know, this data um, acquisition system and put that into the, this, the format. Um, it's better to do it upfront if you can. For those who are already starting, who, who are already deep in their PhDs or postdocs, um, I think this is these standards and tools are great to learn and uh, take advantage if if you have the time and energy. But um, you know, th we understand there's a cost, and so you know, uh, I think a great time is when you just start a new project. I mean, I guess I can continue. So, I mean, in terms of like saying something to the young people, I would say like uh, usually, or a lot of young people, they see all this technology, all these tools, like very daunting because there is so much these days that you have to learn. And I would say, try to see in like, in a different perspective, which is like, you know, it's also very, very exciting. You know, what we could do in our days was very limited. And so try to see this a very great opportunity to do way better science and to acquire more data and trying to get better answers. So what I would say is like, in terms of like 
how to start and what to do is like trying to keep abreast with what's new because the last thing you want is basically to reinvent the wheel like Luigi said before there is a lot out there so try literally to talk to people send emails because people are more approachable than you think especially scientists so I mean it's like it's not a good idea to send an email yes if some people can may not reply but usually you know people are very willing to share data and yes just try to talk to people and to understand what's around Yeah, I just meant to say exactly the same thing. Like, so I'll quote Elena, right on every media, like people are overall much reachable. Like for me, the greatest barrier in growing up during my PhD was realizing how, how much more reachable than I thought other senior scientists were. So that's for sure the most important message. And basically the same thing here. So yeah, use the community. Uh, don't, don't be alone when you are... Uh, and just share with people what you are doing because there is like almost certainly someone who already did something similar. And if it's not the case, you can at least branch to something that exists already and try not to be too far to what other people are doing. Even if it's new, uh, do new stuff, uh, but you can always adapt a tiny bit to be sure that this is not like uh, impossible then to come back to, uh, to, to the standard. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we can uh, finish here this uh, seminar. I thank all of you, all the speakers. Thank you for being here and participating to this uh, initiative. And um, see you in the future somewhere. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much for organizing. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.